Hello, I'm Gary Kitchens. I'd like to talk about what's in a system. An unusual idea, perhaps. In the picture you can see Salisbury Cathedral. Salisbury Cathedral, if it's a system, what's inside it? Can we work that out, rather than know by looking? What's particularly in an open system? So we'll be using some applied system thinking and deductive reasoning about open systems. And we'll be introducing something called the generic reference model. What is an open system? Well, there's lots of views about this. Some people view systems as abstract mental constructs only. I take a somewhat different view. I think it's more useful to pursue an organic metaphor in which systems are real, complex, functional, and either purposive or purposeful. Fundamentally, a system is a whole something, complete. A cell, a person, a team, a process, an economy, a strategy, an egg, an aeroplane, our sun, or a cathedral. Nature is observed to make only holes, whence holism. Systems may present an external boundary. Not all of them do. An economy, for example, doesn't necessarily present an external boundary. An open system exchanges energy, material and information with its environment through its boundary, if any. Suggesting that inflows of energy, material and information may be connected by internal processes to outflows. But what else might be deduced to exist within an open system? Let's find out. Let's start by looking at classic systems theory. In systems theory, a system uh, comprises open, interacting subsystems, themselves having the characteristics of systems. Each subsystem exhibits emergent properties uh, which arise from interactions with all the other subsystems and from hidden internal parts and their intra-actions, which we can't see. From that you may deduce that system, subsystems can be understood only in the context of their dynamic operation in the whole. Isolated subsystems would not exhibit the same emergent properties, capabilities and behaviours, which might seem a bit curious, but it does follow. For example, the human cardiovascular system, or the central nervous system, or the command and control system. You can only understand each of those in the context of, for example, the whole body or uh, of the whole military organisation or whatever. OK. Another way of looking at systems, in the abstract at least, is, uh, is as capable of being or doing or thinking or any combination of those. All systems tend to have being and existence if only as perceptions of wholeness. Some systems, on the other, other hand, also do, that is, perform functions. And some systems think, and we can see that by their behaviour. So, for example, the solar system has being, but it doesn't appear to do much, or think at all. An elevator, on the other hand, has being, does things, performs functions, but does not think. A person has being, does many things, and thinks too, which may appear as behaviour. So we can categorise systems as being, or being and doing, or perhaps being, doing and thinking. So they're not all the same, but we can take a common approach to all of them using that method. Being, doing and thinking then. So in terms of being, doing and thinking, what systems are the following? Is that thinking? What's that? Oh, that's kidney function. And there's the solar system, and we've already discussed that has being, but doesn't do anything. It doesn't perform a function. Mm. It has no apparent purpose, for example. So the general idea, what would you expect to find inside any system? I would expect to find parts, like the organs in the body. Or well, they should be subsystems, organic subsystems, with one or more e organs each, or and interconnections. And this diagram here, which is 
uh, one I picked up from the web, is rather delightful. It's an abstract view of systems. You can see the system in the middle. There it is. And there's a self-produced boundary around there. And you can see it's coupled to uh, another system over here. There's an environment and there's a perturbation from another system, although they're not directly coupled. And you can see there's a flow through with input coming in here and output there. So it's an open system in context. And that's a rather delightful view, uh, abstract view of systems. As we have said, open systems exchange energy, material and information with their environment. That's by definition. So they may adapt to the change. Um, cells are open, for example, with semi-permeable membranes. Humans, factories, the sun, universities and schools, families, all are open systems. And you can see here on the diagram, now this open system has energy coming in. We're not sure what goes inside, but there's energy coming out as well. There's material going in. Something's happening in the middle, perhaps. Material coming out. And there's information going in. Does anything happen in the middle? And information is coming out. We're really interested in the bit we can't see, what's going on in the middle. So inside open systems, there could be energy, material, information flow through and management of these. So for example, this could be a diagram showing the inside performing uh, material flow through, uh, energy flow through, uh, information flow through. We can't tell, but something's going on inside. Then again, if we think about it in uh, terms of a human, for example, uh, there could be sensors, a brain, there could be perceptions, perceptions, organization, and control of flow through going on in here. Or there could be a complete flow through channel, in this case, the alimentary canal with the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach the small intestine, the large intestine, and going through to the anus at the bottom. That's a complete throughput channel. Or there could be an in-out relationship here as we have oxygen going in, into the lungs, uh, passing oxygen to the blood, um, uh, collecting CO2 from the, uh, from the blood and passing it back out through the esophagus. So we've got energy and waste management there as well. Energy coming in, in the form of oxygen, and waste management in the form of the expulsion of carbon dioxide. Hmm. Or we can think about it in terms of purpose and goal seeking. Inside the open system there is something here, these two people making an example. I am cutting stones. That's one view of purpose. And another one, I'm building a cathedral, which is a rather uh, grander view of purpose. All coming from inside the open system. If we look at um, the human body, for example, we can identify a number of closely coupled interacting organic subsystems. And you can see them here. I'm not going to go through them individually, but uh, what they don't show on this diagram is how they interact to create a viable body. One of the things you can do is consider whether the body would be viable if you removed any one of them. Uh, perhaps the reproductive system bottom right is not necessary in the short term. But of course the viable body can't evolve and adapt unless it reproduces. So short term, maybe not long term. Now, from the, uh, the living systems, which share many of the same internal systems, we can look perhaps towards uh, man-made systems. And we find they've got uh, many counterparts to the um, biological systems. Uh, they share many of the same features. So, for example, we've got in both natural systems and man-made purposeful systems, we've got uh, environment sensing, threat detection, threat avoidance, self-maintenance, self-defense, central control and coordination, decision making, resource, energy, power and waste management, and a continual rebuilding of self and structure. 
At the very least, any open system should have internal energy management, material or resource management, and information management, as we've seen. But the surprisingly common between natural systems and purposeful man-made systems, when you start looking at the fundamentals. Think about it in factory terms. Here we've got material coming in, product coming out, the various processes in the middle have to be energised, and it's been being continually upgraded and rebuilt, which requires energy. And there's a product demand, so there's information flowing at the right there and coming out uh, on the left. Put the lot together and you can see that we've got material in, information in, energy in. Uh, we've got product out, dissipation out, waste out. Um, and we can see from the, uh, from the words that there's a major difference between natural and man-made systems. And this is quite an important idea. Natural systems extract energy from the flow through and they rebuild themselves also from the flow through. Man-made systems, on the other hand, use money as an exchange and control medium. Our product sells for money, buy new material in, energy supplies are bought, you maintain and upgrade and rebuild the machinery, uh, enhance operator skills, pay wages, advertising recruiting, all from the profits. So it doesn't rebuild itself in the same way. Also, natural systems are self-organising, whereas man-made systems may need organisational management. It's a stellar model. This is part of a much bigger model, in fact, showing a man-made factory model. And you can see materials in, in the centre panel where it goes from Q1, P1, Q2, P2, right the way along there. And you can see defectives uh, in the uh, materials in process being channeled backwards. You can see throughput and product output sales there, sales income coming in here. And if everything works right after you've paid out the total outgoings and the total income, you should have a profit if you work out correctly. Hmm. That's a complicated looking diagram. Um, and it's a dynamic model, which you can... Uh, uh, undertake experiments with it's a test bed effectively. How does it look when we look at it like this? That's the same model and now you can see it in systems terms, interacting system terms, and it's very like the theoretical model I showed you earlier of um, the insides of any system. So we got parts acquisition, assembly and throughput, manpower resources, sales and finance, and market and resource pools are part of the external environment. Okay, you can see from this that each of these is really comprehensible in terms of its values, what's going on only in the context of all the others. Each subsystem has particular emergent properties only when it's interacting with the others in the whole. And they're all mutually interdependent, if only in financial terms, but they are totally mutually interdependent. And the whole presents uh, emergent properties as it interacts with market and resource pools and other businesses not shown. So it matches the theoretical diagram quite nicely. There's a natural factory which I'm not going to go into in any detail but you will find that it's very much the same. This particular factory has is the thing that it makes. It makes proteins uh, and it uses energy and it creates white waste byproducts and so forth. Very similar analogy. It's surprising how close the analogy is. Now let's look at this generic reference model that I mentioned at the beginning. And we'll start off with taking a, a structural view of a system. An organic or structural view sees a system as comprising interactive, interacting tangible subsystems. So there may be a boundary subsystems, connections and relationships. And you can see that under structure. Under influence you can see cohesion, dispersion and environment. Cohesion, cohesion tending to bring the parts of the system together, dispersion tending to push them apart, and cohesion and dispersion tend to be in balance if the system is in balance. And there's potential there, there's power, capacity and redundancy. 
A functional view of a system is somewhat different, however. You can see here it comes under uh, three simultaneous headings, mission management, viability management, and resource management. Uh, these uh, can't be seen uh, separate from each other. They're simultaneous individual aspects of the whole. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. Mission management at the top here sees uh, um, some external operational environment from which uh, it's necessary to collect information, set and reset objectives, strategize and plan, execute the plan, and cooperate with others if necessary in the environment. Um, and take that action goes into the operational environment, changing what's going on in the environment, and so you have to collect new information. So this is a continual process of mission management. Similarly at the bottom, with resource management, there is considered to be some external resource environment from which you can acquire resources, store the resources, distribute the resources within the system, convert and utilize these resources, and discard any excess or waste or product. And then there's viability. Viability in the middle. Now that comes as SMESH, as an acronym. And we start off with synergy. All the parts within the system have to cooperate, coordinate and complement each other. And that leads to survival in the ability to avoid detection, self-defend, tolerate damage and even repair damage. Then there's evolution, the ability to accommodate, adapt and advance. And maintenance, the ability to detect, locate, replace and remove. Uh, all of which leads to homeostasis, the dynamic equilibrium within a system or the ability to maintain internal environment. So these are all aspects of a system which will allow it to pursue purpose, to continue to work. This is the energy supply. And here we can see uh, the ability to persist in the event of external threat, internal threat of defect, and changes in environment. So we've got the beginnings of a generic reference model. So far we've got a holistic view of what has to exist inside any complex system. So we've got being, doing and or thinking as we see. This holistic view is generic. It's not limited by scale or type, context or domain. So how could we use this generic reference model? Well, the first one is to use the generic reference model simply as a, a guide, a template, to show completeness. And we're going to have a look at that in a moment. Alternatively, you could look at uh, a correspondence between a real system that you've got and its parts and the GRM elements to understand complex systems. For example, the hymenoptera, the social insects, governments, conflicts, purposeful organisations. Or maybe you could form a basis for dynamic simulation, including context, other interacting systems, and an operational environment. We'll have a, have a look at those three. Here's a generic reference model template. This is function management, and as we've already seen, that's made up of uh, mission management, viability management, and resource management. And they've just been drawn up on a table here. So here's the generic reference model collect information, set, reset objectives, strategize and plan, the viability model, synergy, maintenance, evolution, so forth, and the resource management model, acquire, store, distribute resources, etc. And here's some system of interest we're going to examine, and we've left blanks to be filled in. So, to appreciate a complex system, fill in the blanks for the chosen system of interest, e.g. a hive of honeybees, an army tactical unit, a manufacturer, Emergency, emergency services, air traffic management, disaster relief organisation. Well, I don't know, let's start off with a, a hive of honeybees. How do we collect information? Well, we have bees going out uh, looking for um, uh, nectar. Um, we're all familiar, I hope, from having seen uh, nature programmes with the honeybee dance where a bee that has found some uh, interesting amounts of nectar comes back and does a wiggle dance on a so-called dance floor to show the um, quality of the source of nectar 
the direction and the distance of the sort of nectar. And um, that, al that information uh, allows the bees, uh, the other bees, to uh, choose to go after that uh, fresh new source. And we can go through and cover all the others. Uh, acquiring resources, well we looked at that. Storing resources, we know what honeybees do. Uh, they store resources in um, uh, wax. Uh, they distribute the resources by feeding the young particularly. And they convert the resources into um, fresh fresh babies of course. And they dispose of the waste, including dead honeybees, because the honeybees have um, some bees that are looked at as undertakers. Um, the synergy of honeybees, worker bees, is um, very well understood. They maintain themselves by discarding uh, and keeping the place clean. Um, evolution is something that's happening very, very slowly and needn't bother us at the moment. Survival, they're well able to defend their hive and if necessary to pick up their young and create a new hive. And homeostasis, they even have air conditioning within hives to keep the temperature. Uh, at the right level. You could um, do this for each of these emergency service air traffic. Disaster relief organisation is quite an easy one uh, and also quite simple. Try it, it's good fun. Some systems think and behave. Some systems exhibit behaviour which is response to stimulus. Simple systems re have a knee-jerk, instinctive behaviour. For example a uh, a burglar alarm, a tripwire, a wasp sting. Higher order systems consider. They may suppress this knee jerk and respond intelligently, intelligent, if at all. For example, uh, in boxing, quite often um, uh, an intelligent boxer will ignore um, a feint um, uh, from a, an attacker. Higher order systems may not respond in the same way every time to the same stimulus. My favourite example is when a woman slaps a man's face. He may flinch, raise an eyebrow, but otherwise do nothing. If the woman slaps him again, he may duck, he may deflect a blow, he may retreat, or some men may even strike back. The situation, relationship and previous experience, cultural beliefs, uh, all help to colour behaviour. So how can we understand behaviour. Well this rather complicated model is after Carl Jung and this is the GRM behaviour management model. Uh, it's not as complicated as it, it necessarily looks if we follow it from start to finish. We have a stimulus coming in at the left which uh, is uh, enters an area called cognition where it is recognised from uh, our understanding of such stimulus, world models, tacit knowledge coming here. And what comes out is an interpretation of the stimulus, what its stimulus is thought to be. Um, from that we get the selection of a re behavioural response to that stimulus. And that goes into excitation and outer response. So the, through the centre here we've got recognition, interpretation, selection of response, excitation of response. And so this is a simple stimulus response model. We can also see under the grey here that we've got nature versus nurture. Now nature is what gives us the de-jerk. And we can see in nature we've got things that uh, Carl Jung suggested is collective unconscious, instinct, archetypes, libido, aggression, energy, character and emotion. Whereas uh, under the nurture side we have things like experience, world morals and notably this curious thing called a belief system. And we can see that the belief system uh, has within it beliefs, not surprisingly, but it also uh, characterises roles, stereotypes, categories, values, ethics, morals, ideologies, and very importantly, training. Uh, a group of people can be trained to behave in a particular way, which uh, will supersede their natural reaction. So, for example, a group of soldiers, instead of running away, will stick together uh, hunker down and face up to an enemy, which might be against their natural instincts. Here's the generic reference model that we've been talking about in layered form. There are a total of five panels. 
you can see mission management at the top, collect information, set reject, cooperate with others. And there's behavior in the center panel, then form in the lower panel, resource management in the top uh, left panel, and viability, viability from the top in the right hand panel. Uh, all is happening all at once, so this is very much um, um, sequential, parallel, all going on at once. You can't take one aspect of it and treat it as independent. Each layer represents an individual aspect of the whole. None can be considered separately. The GRM may also be used as a basis for um, looking at simulations. And here I've got two competing uh, organizations. Uh, here's one and here's another. They're competing within an environment. And you can see that uh, each of these has got mission management, behavior management, form management, viability management. And um, the resource management is coupled to the outside world through a logistics system. So the logistics system is effectively keeping it supplied. And there's a procurement system here is effectively adding in new bits and replacements to enhance it. And exactly the same going on over here in parallel. All right. So we've got two competing systems and they are being fed uh, with logistics and uh, upgraded equipments from outside. Ooh, that was fun. Now we've looked at the layered version again, but this time I've in instantiated it. And this is a partial instantiation of uh, a layered GRM of a naval ship engaging an enemy at sea. This is one of the ships. There's another ship, and there's the environment in between the two ships. And we can see mission management at the top, and we can see resource management at the left, viability management at the right, behavior management in the middle, form management at the bottom. Form man management has things like radar, navigation, situation displays, communications, weapons management, resource displays, battle damage displays, internal system sensors, ship controls, weapon controls, weapons, and so on. Behavior management has cognition, behavior selection, and stimulation as before. In fact, there's very little change here. This is what's going on in the um, minds, particularly, of the commanders and the people uh, doing the various uh, jobs and roles as part of the fighting ship. And then at the top, mission management is presented in much more um, militaristic terms. Assess situation, identify threats and opportunities, and then enters a decision mode. Two kinds of decision are made. There's naive decisions in which you generate all the options of how to respond to a situation, review all the constraints, and then select the preferred option. This is called naive decision making. And then there's something called recognition prime decisions, which is uh, really undertaken by expert decision makers under time pressure, usually. They generate options in sequence, and they simulate mentally whether they think they would work out, and the first one that uh, is suitable is accepted. This is much, much faster than the naive decision-making. Um, and uh, sometimes commanders work to this, whereas the people working for them work to this, which can create tensions. Anyway, in either case, you initiate the action, monitor it, and assess the situation as the situation changes. This is half of a whole simulation with environment between the two, and one can work out all sorts of interesting things and see emergent behavior coming from the interaction between the two ships in their environment. What's missing? Well, we've deduced this from the outside looking in and you can't see everything. So I'll give an example here. You could um, listen to a, a broadcast of an orchestra and you might be able to deduce that there were sections in the orchestra from the side of the hole. Uh, particularly if it was in stereo. Uh, but the actual system design need not group entities into the same subsystems as the GRM supposes. So the listener cannot be sure about orchestra groupings just from the sound of the whole. You can't also from the outside see what are the internal synergistic links for communi 
engagement and coordination, cooperation and contribution, orchestration of interactions. So it's possible in principle to create and simulate a principal system on the framework of the GRM to contrast with the actual system. But the GRM doesn't tell you everything about the actual system. Some things have to be supplied specific to the occasion. Autonomous systems. Most man-made systems do not behave in the sense that Carl Jung supposed. There is no such thing as a collective unconscious or belief system in technological equipment, for example. However, designers are creating more capable robots. RPVs, robot waiters, nurses, driverless trains, robot taxis, autonomous peace officers, surgeons. Reaper. That's an Israeli border vehicle. Automatic surgeons. And that's automatic nurses, autonomous nurses. The time is right, I'm suggesting, for such autonomous systems to make decisions to choose between options. And that involves ethics, morality, beliefs, conscience and tacit knowledge. No mean challenge. But that is the challenge that's facing us in the near-term future. So there we are, what's in an open system. It is possible to deduce what's inside an open system and to be right, in minimalist terms. There could be much more in a system than can be sensibly deduced from the outside. For example, thinking that does not necessarily result in visible behaviour. There could also be complexities to address a wide variety of contexts, past, present and future, and contingencies. And there's things about the open system that you might not understand. I showed the pyramid there. That's the Great Pyramid of Khufu, with all the various passages um, and so forth. Their slopes have been measured there in the ancient Egyptian unit, the Seked. And these are units of uh, slope measurement. So the slope of the whole pyramid, shown here, is five and a half Seked. Just over 50 degrees in our terms. But this does not equate to two degrees. If you look at it in degrees, these various slopes, this one, for example, is 45 degrees. And uh, that's 7 seked. Now this is 14 seked, which is exactly uh, half the slope. If the numbers work in the wrong direction, the smaller the number, the bigger the slope. Right. Uh, but this is exactly half in seked terms. But if that's 45 degrees, far from being at 22.5 degrees, this is 26.5 degrees, because it's a slope measure. So if you measure in degrees, you miss something out. Measure in seced and you find that is a bisected to give you that. That one is bisected to give you the slope of the pyramid. And we have these two are both the same. They're both eight and a half. But you might notice that five and a half plus eight and a half gives you 14. So there appears to be something else going on here. Uh, to do with numerology, or magic, or some form of numerical completeness. In summary, there is plenty inside open systems. This flow-through, organised structure, uh, an inflow of energy, material and information. Sensors, processors and effectors enable functions to be energised from the flow-through. Potentially there's self-organizing, self-managing and, and purposeful systems. Able to plan and prosecute missions, achieve objectives. Example, a platoon of soldiers or an ad hoc fire brigade. Now, by that I mean uh, humans self-organize themselves quite uh, miraculously, apparently. If there's a fire somewhere uh, and there's water nearby in buckets, People will organise themselves into a bucket brigade uh, at the drop of a hat. It's something that we do, and it's autopoietic, self-organising. Then there's leafcutter ant colonies, which are quite miraculous in the way they organise themselves to um, grow farms in order to feed their young. 
And then there's be intelligent behaviour management, anticipation and planning, system-wide control, adaptation to situation environment, moral compass, belief systems, tacit knowledge, even empathy, for example, in famine relief organisations. There is indeed plenty inside open systems. And in conclusion, the generic reference model purports to show what is inside any complex system. It employs both deductive system th thinking and tacit knowledge from a wide range of real-world systems. Interestingly, it avoid, affords ab initio system design synthesis without any reduction. <laughs>